Supreme Court said, no, it's First Amendment right not to be, not to have coerced disclosure uh, of that membership or having to give the money to the organization. Well, so the, so the nonprofit corporations were there before Citizens United, they're there today, and uh, they can continue to operate. But the super PAC phenomenon seems to have taken over. And uh, the super PACs are political action committees, not necessarily corporations, who register with the FEC uh, and then can spend their money on political campaigns. There's an organizational uh, structural difference between the committees and the nonprofit corporations. The nonprofit corporations are not subject to income tax, and I, mean, I guess the uh, political, the super PACs probably aren't either. So despite the wonderful First Amendment language used by Justice Kennedy in the Citizens United case, despite its utility, the utility of that language, and what the court actually did for future First Amendment cases, um, enhancing the likelihood that the court will strike down speech restrictive laws on their face, that's despite the good things about the decision that it's a strong precedent, um, the court's judicial activism was somewhat unseemly, distasteful, hypocritical in light of uh, what uh, the judicial conservatives say the proper judicial role is. Uh, the court's uncritical endorsement um, and advancement of corporate personhood is troubling. I really do think that the court needs to thoroughly re-examine the nature of corporate personhood and authorize restrictions on what corporations can do with regard to elections, else money will continue to dominate our elections. Um, so let's turn now from, let's take a pause, because I've got to change, I've got to get a different file up here. Stretch, take a minute, I'll be with you in a second. So, let's move on from political speech to different kinds of speech that government tries to restrict uh, and um, consider first subversive speech, um, speech that government thinks will subvert important societal values, um, upset things in our society in highly undesirable ways, uh, which also invites us to consider symbolic speech um, and um, protest speech. And the story starts, I think, with Yada Stromberg, who um, was 19 years old and a student at UCLA back in 1929. She's the one in the middle, sort of like one of you, uh, interested in economics while she was studying at uh, UCLA. Uh, and she was a counselor at a summer camp in the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, a summer camp for communist working class families from the Los Angeles area. Uh, and the campers were kids from 6 to 16. Uh, and Yada, as a counselor, would get the kids up every morning, uh, hoist on a little flagpole a red triangular flag with a hammer and sickle on it, the flag of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, became the Soviet Union, uh, the communist flag. Uh, and as the flag was hoisted up the flagpole, yet led the campers in reciting a pledge of allegiance to the communist flag. I pledge allegiance to the workers' red flag and to the cause for which it stands, one aim throughout our lives, freedom for the working class. Somewhat charming, quaint. Um, one day in 1929, the camp was raided by a posse of American legionnaires led by the district attorney of San Bernardino County, who um, came upon the red flag, I'm sure they had a tip that it was there, um, and arrested all of the adults at the camp, including Yetta Stromberg, uh, including a mom who was visiting her camper child, uh, the camp cook, and so on. They confiscated the red flag. They took the arrested grown-ups to jail in San Bernardino County and charged them with a felony of violating a California law in the penal code that says that whoever displays a red flag in any public place or in any meeting place or public assembly as a sign, symbol, or emblem of opposition to organized government is guilty of a felony, a serious crime. Well, the case went to trial in San Bernardino County, and the jury returned a verdict of guilty. Uh, there was an appeal, but um, Yetta was sentenced to a prison term of one to ten years. Uh, she appealed, um, and the appeal of the other adults uh, was successful, but Yetta lost her appeal. She was the one who was responsible for hoisting the flag, and her conviction was upheld by the California Court of Appeal. And the ACLU took Yetta's case to the United States Supreme Court, which handed down its decision in 1931, um, which is a reasonable period of time from the events. That's sort of a normal timeline for reaching the Supreme Court. While the case was working its way to the Supreme Court, Yetta was out on bail. She was not in prison during the appeal. Uh, and then the court decided the case in 1931, Stromberg versus California, in an opinion by then Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes. And the court emphasized that it's a fundamental principle of our constitutional system that we have free political discussion to the end that government may be responsive to the will of the people and that changes can be obtained by lawful means. In other words, Americans do have the right to oppose our government. Uh, and the ability to change, or to advocate change of our government, overthrow of our government, uh, is what makes us a free people. 
and Justice uh, Hughes for the majority of the court, concluded that this law was so vague and so indefinite that it permitted, as it did in Yetta's case, punishment of the opportunity that we all ought to have to oppose our government. And the court concluded that the statute was therefore invalid on its face, in all its applications. Striking that this was the first time in American history, 1931, a long time after 1791 when the First Amendment was adopted, this is the first time in American history that the court had struck down a law on First Amendment grounds. Whether it was a federal law or a state law, it was the first time in history that the court had done that. And it's, you wonder, how can that possibly be? Why, why did it take so long for the uh, court to get around to deciding a First Amendment case and throwing out a law, uh, either a state law or a federal law? And one reason is that the uh, 14th Amendment wasn't enacted until um, 1868. Uh, the other reason is, is that the Congress didn't pass any laws uh, after the Sedition Act of 1798 up until the Red Scare era at the end of World War I. Uh, when they enacted laws like, um, like the one that, uh, that caught Yetta. Um, it requires going back to one of our famous features about the f effect of the 14th Amendment. Remember, the First Amendment applies only to the federal government, not to the states. So the states were entirely free, at least until the 14th Amendment was adopted, to restrict speech, and that would not violate the federal constitution. When the 14th Amendment due process clause was adopted, that explicitly spoke to the states, bound the states, and said no state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, but then the court didn't have any state cases until um, Gitlow in 1925. Uh, I mentioned him when we were talking about this before. Benjamin Gitlow was head of the Socialist Party in New York and uh, wrote a um, manifesto, the left-wing manifesto, and it called for overthrowing organized government uh, and establishing a revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat, standard communist rhetoric. Uh, and he was prosecuted under a New York state law, what they called a criminal, criminal anarchy law, uh, and convicted. And his case went to the Supreme Court, which decided, as you recall, that the word liberty in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment incorporated First Amendment principles and applied them to the states. So Gitlow won that vitally important constitutional principle that New York and all other states had to respect the First Amendment, freedom of speech in the press. But Gitlow lost his case because in the mid-1920s, his case was 1925, uh, in the mid-1920s, the majority of the court did not think that this kind of subversive speech, Gitlow's out there opposing organized government, uh, was within the freedom of speech protected by the First Amendment. So he lost his case and had to serve his term in prison. And the, uh, aside from the fact that the First Amendment principles didn't bind the states, really, until 1925, uh, the other reason that there hadn't been any cases before Stromberg was that Congress had laid low, um, perhaps uh, chastised by their experience with the um, Sedition Act of 1798. The Congress simply hadn't enacted any new um, speech-restrictive laws up until World War I, all the time from 1798 to World War I. You ought to know something about the Sedition Act of 1798, because it's a very important historical milestone um, with regard to freedom of speech in the press. Uh, 1798, the president is John Adams, uh, a Federalist, and his vice president is Thomas Jefferson, a Republican. The, the Federalists then were the equivalent of the Republicans today. The Republicans then are the equivalent of the Democrats today. Um, and John Adams and the Federalists were deeply, genuinely concerned that the Thomas Jefferson-led party uh, was in bed with the French uh, and uh, fearful of getting us dragged into another war with Britain. And so they wanted to silence the Jefferson-led party press. The press in those days was extremely partisan. You had Republican papers, you had Federalist papers. Uh, and in an attempt to muzzle the Republican press, the Congress, which included many people who had, you know, it's only seven years after the First Amendment had been adopted, who had been there at the creation of the First Amendment, and nonetheless voted for the Sedition Act of 1798, that basically made it a crime to criticize the President or Congress. It made it a crime to say anything false, scandalous, and malicious against the government, either House of Congress or the President, with intent to defame them or bring them into contempt, and so on, or stir up sedition. And it was extremely easy, under the procedures of the day, for the government to make its case. Uh, and in fact, 14 editors of Jeffersonian newspapers were prosecuted and convicted under the Sedition Act of 1798. Uh, they appealed, but um, their appeals were never heard by the United States Supreme Court. That's because the Sedition Act expired by its own terms. It was sunsetted when it was adopted. It was sunsetted to expire the day before the next president took office. And so the law expired before the cases of the 14 different editors uh, could reach the Supreme Court of the United States. So the Supreme Court never actually um, considered the constitutionality of the Sedition Act. As we'll see when we reach New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, the court considered it there simply as an analogy the law wasn't in effect anymore, uh, and in driving home the point that everybody now believes that the Sedition Act is completely inconsistent with our free speech tradition and with the First Amendment. These days, nothing like the Sedition Act would pass constitutional muster. Um, and in fact, the next president who took office the day after the Sedition Act um, expired was Thomas Jefferson. He was the 
next elected president. You could have, as you did in, under Adams, you could have back then president and vice president of different parties to change that later on. When Jefferson becomes president, what does he do first? He immediately pardoned all of the editors who had been convicted under the act. Um, he said that he, he wrote a letter later on uh, saying that he had pardoned the convicted men because he considered the act to be a nullity as absolute and palpable as if Congress had ordered us all to fall down and worship a golden image. Um, well, the pardons by Jefferson uh, were one factor, and then Congress later on voted to compensate the jailed editors and later on their families uh, for having been subjected to the act, and then a general consensus developed that the Sedition Act really was antithetical to our First Amendment values, and that, in fact, criticizing government is an American right, not a reason to punish um, a citizen for criticizing the government. Um, so it seems that historically Congress chastised by the experience with the Sedition Act uh, learned its lesson, didn't attempt anything more in the way of subversive speech regulation until the First World War when, as frequently happens, wartime pressure, pressure seems to happen in every country, wartime pressures combined with hysteria about the Bolshevik Revolution and not wanting it to spread to this country and upset our capitalist system led to a rash of new both federal and state laws like the ones that were used to prosecute um, Yetta Stromberg and Benjamin Gitlow. And then Yetta's case uh, was unusual in another way, not just that it was the first case to upset a law on First Amendment ground, but think about it. What did she do? What was her speech? She hoisted the, the red flag. That's what she was convicted of. Uh, that's not speech, is it? That's conduct. But it's expressive conduct. It's conduct that imports a message. She's sending a message by that conduct. Uh, it's clearly meant to convey ideas, in her case, to express solidarity with the working class and support for the communist system in opposition to the capitalist system. And the statute, the California statute, singled out displaying a red flag as a symbol of opposition to organized government. And the Supreme Court in the Stromberg case, without any real analysis or discussion at all, uh, simply treated or use raising the hoisting the red flag as speech for First Amendment purposes. There was a verbal component, you mean the, the Pledge of Allegiance? Yeah, so if because of the hoisting of the flag, I think it's something more. If she had not hoisted the flag, but then speech, would she have felt arrested on the ground? You mean arrested for, for um, the words in the pledge? Yeah. Well, not under this law, because this law only applied to uh, displaying a red flag. Uh, could she have been convicted of simply hoisting the flag without the pledge? Yeah. Yeah. Though the words enabled the prosecution to argue that hoisting the red flag was meant to be a symbol of opposition to organized government. It explained, it explained her conduct. So the Stromberg case was the beginning of the symbolic speech doctrine, uh, now well recognized, and that seed planted by the Stromberg case sprouted and grew into lots of other contexts. Um, the O'Brien case back in 1968, uh, as a way to protest the Vietnam War, uh, young men subject to the draft would get together on the federal courthouse steps, for example, and burn their draft cards. Young men had to carry draft cards that showed that they had registered with the draft, and they had happened with them at all times, um, because they might be called up by the government and have to go serve in Vietnam. And to protest, they had draft card burning demonstrations. And a guy named O'Brien was arrested on the courthouse steps in Boston, and his case went to the Supreme Court, which had no difficulty at all recognizing what he did as subject to the First Amendment, <laughs> treated as speech, burning a draft card. No words. Burning the draft card was treated as speech. Unfortunately, it's a little bit like Gitlow's case. O'Brien lost his case, and the court said the government had a significant interest in um, preserving draft cards intact so that they could identify who would be called up um, in, in the draft and so on. Uh, so he, he won the symbolic speech point, he lost his case. Uh, and then there were the flag burning cases, like uh, Texas versus Johnson was one where um, Johnson went to the Republican convention and to protest something about the Reagan administration, burned the American flag, was prosecuted under a law that prohibited flag desecration, and the court five to four um, throughout his conviction. Symbolic speech. Um, then there was a cross burning case and the Bonghits case, and there have been many more. Um, most recently, uh, or at least one of the most recent situations um, after Bong Hits was uh, the Reverend Terry Jones uh, from Jacksonville, Florida, who in the 2010 decided that the Koran, <laughs> what's so funny? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he's, he's a pastor in this little teeny church down in Florida, and he, his thing was that Islam is uh, evil and a lie and so on, and uh, he actually conducted a trial of the Koran, a little kangaroo court kind of trial, uh, and convicted of the Koran and then uh, burnt, burned it uh, as symbolic speech. And at the time, he, and, you know, the American government was extremely concerned about this. Uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Gates um, w personally called him and asked him not to do it. President Obama appealed.